want to read from the Word of God in Isaiah chapter 48. The book of Isaiah chapter 48. And we'll read from verse number 12 of this chapter. Let us hear the Word of God. Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel am I called. I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. All ye assemble yourselves and hear, which among them have declared these things. The Lord hath loved them. He will do his pleasure in Babylon, and his arm shall be on the Cameroonians. I, even I, have spoken, yea, I have called him, I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. Come ye near unto me, hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was there am I. And now the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches of thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldst go. O thou hast hearkened to my commandments, then have thy peace have been of a river, and thy righteousness of the waves of the sea. Thy seed also have been as the sand, and the offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. His name should not have been cut off or destroyed from before me. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing declare ye, tell this, offering even to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. And they thirsted not when he led them through the deserts, caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He claimed the rock also, the waters gushed out. There is no peace, saith the Lord unto the wicked. God will bless the reading of his word. Think it's in a sense, needless to say that we believe very, very strongly, but it must be said that true Christianity is Trinitarian. Throughout the church history that we all love to read and to peruse, the faithful church of Jesus Christ has always held to this truth of a triune God as is reflected in the creeds and the confessions of Reformed churches. We've had a brother, Dr. Riddle, speak to us already, and he has quoted from the Westminster Confession. And as a Presbyterian, of course, that is the confession that I have signed. And it says in chapter 2 and section 3, In the unity of the Godhead there be three persons of one substance, power and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Now, belief in the doctrine of the Trinity is, of course, based on the Word of God. Scripture is God's special revelation that has been brought before us in the previous lecture, and, of course, rightly so. That special revelation, of course, was made necessary because of the fall of man. There is natural revelation. We've heard that Psalm 19 and quoted and other verses as well that bring before us that great truth of natural revelation. But because of man's fallen state, the fact is that he's stricken with total inability and therefore he cannot read the book of nature properly. His mind is darkened, cannot understand what God has done in creation and we're all very aware of that as Dr. Van Til once said, man has put out his own eyes by his fall and therefore he cannot see or understand what God has said, even though he is still inexcusable as a result of natural revelation from all around him. And so it was necessary if men were to be redeemed that God would give a special revelation 
And that special revelation, of course, has been given, and we have it in our hands today. Namely, we have the Scriptures of Truth. Now, the Scriptures are essentially and basically a self-revelation of Almighty God. It's a self-revelation in which he presents himself as the indivisible personal essence existing eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, as a Trinitarian God, we come to that conclusion because we are led to it by the scriptures of truth. Even though our finite minds cannot plumb the depths of the mystery of the doctrine of the Trinity, and it is a mystery to such a degree, yet at the same time, we must underline, we must make it very, very clear that while a complete understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, and I underline the word complete, is not attainable by finite man, due to the fact that God is incomprehensible in his own being, yet a true knowledge of the doctrine of the Trinity can be deduced from God's precious world. And that observation is based upon what we call the knowability of God. There is the un incomprehensibility of God. He's infinite, therefore you cannot explain God in totality, obviously. Yet at the same time, when we rejoice in this, men and women, God is knowable. Scripture is God's special revelation. And his own self-revelation is at the very center of all that he has revealed himself to be in the word of God. And so that self-revelation of God includes, therefore, the doctrine of the Trinity. The Bible reveals the triune God. This self-revelation of God means that our understanding of any part of the Scripture depends upon our acceptance of God's revelation of himself in his own word. If we reject what God has revealed of himself, it is impossible to proceed any further in our study of the Word of God. This means that the rejection, therefore, of the doctrine of the Trinity renders it impossible for an individual or a body of men to accept anything else in the Scripture because God's self-revelation is Trinitarian. That is fundamental to the doctrine of God. The God who has revealed himself unto men is the one true God who exists in the Trinity of divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now we are aware, I'm sure, that over time, over many, many generations, there has been denial of the doctrine of the Trinity. I don't want to get into that in any great detail, but it certainly must be mentioned. Even from the earliest times of the history of the Christian church, the doctrine of the Trinity has been subject to many and to various forms of opposition and denial. In more modern times, this opposition is still present. It is found among liberals and modernists and in various denominations, in the oneness churches, in the cults and so forth. The Opposition and the denial of those groups uh, regarding the Trinity is, of course, the presentation of the devil's old heresies under new owners. That's really what it's all about. That's what they're doing. They're just simply rehearsing what Satan has long ago brought in by way of denial of this wonderful doctrine. And we look at the time prior to the Reformation. If we look at the time after the Reformation, we find that these heresies still prevail. And they are, are of course, summed up under various names like Arianism. And we know how that all came about uh, in terms of the teaching of Arius. He taught the, the heresy that the Father alone is eternal, that Christ was the first preacher, and also 
that the Spirit was the first and the greatest creature made by the Son. And all of that, of course, was rejected by the Council of Nicaea in that year 325 AD. And therefore, we are understanding of Arianism it's still very much in existence among various groups and various movements. Sabellianism, named after that third century African bishop, Sibelius, who taught that God is one single person and that the names Father, Son and Holy Spirit are not personal names for three distinct persons within the Godhead but are merely describing modes uh, that the one person, the Father, as he would have said, uh, uh, occupied with regard to his greatness and his power and so on. And so we have that also very much in existence today in various circles. Then Socinianism that came after the Reformation, really, named after that Italian theologian, uh, Faustus, Socinius, and so forth. And all of these are groups and movements that arose up within the Christian church and denied the doctrine of the Trinity. But our purpose today is to think to some degree, in the time that's allotted to me, on the doctrine itself, it's one thing to look at the denial of the Trinity, and that's important, but it's more, it's more um, blessed and it's more edifying to look at the doctrine to some degree, to try to come to terms with what God has revealed concerning this marvellous truth that is at the very heart of Scripture, uh, at the very heart of the doctrine of God. And may I also say, at the very heart of redemption, the whole of the Bible and what God has given to us in Scripture is a revelation of God's great plan for the redemption of sinners. And therefore, the doctrine of the Trinity must be understood in that context, the context of redemption. We are sinners who need a redeemer. And thank God, one of the three, the second person of the Godhead, he's the one, not the Father or the, or the Spirit, but it's the second person who stepped into time, who took our humanity, all in order to redeem us from our sins. And therefore, we can see how the doctrine of the Trinity is so vitally important with regard to the whole scheme and plan of the Bible in terms of what God has done for men uh, with regard to their redemption. The word Trinity expresses, therefore, the truth revealed in Scripture of the one divine essence subsisting in three distinct persons. God is one as to his eternal spiritual essence. And that divine essence exists necessarily in three modes, each of which is spoken of in Scripture in personal terms. And so the doctrine of the Trinity is summed up for us, yes, as I said, in the Confession of Faith and also in our shorter catechism, and it answers in question number six, how many persons are there in the Godhead? And the answer is there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. Now, the closing words of that answer to question six of our catechism, the same in substance, equal in power and glory, are very, very important words. The word substance signifies the divine essence. The Word of God shows that the divine essence cannot be divided. And we will see something about that as we look at some scriptures. The Word of God also shows that each person of the Godhead possesses this indivisible uh, or this indivisible essence, not a fragment of it or a third of it, but each person possesses the whole of the divine essence. And that is proved, of course, by the fact that each person of the Godhead possesses all the attributes that are seen in that essence, and therefore that means that each one possesses the whole of the essence. And so these are very clear matters that are set before us with regard to the doctrine of the Trinity. You see, 
the essence of God cannot be fragmented. It cannot be divided. The point is that the Bible therefore warrants us to teach and to, to set forth what has been said in this kind of language, that God is three in one and one in three. And therefore the teaching of the Bible concerning God can only be interpreted properly within a Trinitarian framework. Now the Bible reveals the Trinity in various ways. Let me give you a few uh, suggestions as to how the Bible reveals the Trinity in various ways. Number one, in certain statements that cannot be understood in any other way except that of teaching the Trinity. And I will take you to Genesis 1, 26. I want you to look at that verse now, please. Genesis chapter 1 and the verse number 26. And let's just think about it for one or two. And there you read the word of God at the time of creation. And what he said as creation was coming forth. So Genesis 1, 26, it says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fire of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. The image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. When you look at Genesis 1 and you read it and study it, you will find that up to this point, you have what we may call the language of command. God said, and so forth. And then all things began to come into being. So there's the language of command. But when you come to verse 26, here's the language of consultation. Because it says there, God said, let us make man in our image. The language of consultation. But the question is, with whom does God consult? And of course, Men have put forth their ideas, and some have said that he consulted with angels. Not so at all, because the Bible nowhere teaches that angels had any part in man's creation. And of course, the words are, let us make man in our image, not in the image of angels. And the Bible teaches very clearly a clear distinction between angelic nature and human nature. You think of Genesis, or sorry, Hebrews 2, 16, where it says that Christ took not on him the nature of angels, but the seed of Abraham. Why? Because he didn't come to save angels that had fallen. He came to save men. And therefore, angelic nature and human nature have no correlation. There are two different natures altogether, so there's that distinction between the two natures. Genesis 1.27 moreover says, God created man in his own image. And so there's no mention of angels here, where you have this language of consultation. When you think about this matter and, and think it through, as I said earlier, we must always keep redemption in mind, because the reason why we cherish and we defend and we love the doctrine of the Trinity is, as I said earlier, one of those divine persons became our Redeemer. And as a result of that great redemptive work, what God did at the beginning when he made man, prior to the fall, of course, he then, he then works again to bring about a restoration of it when he redeems man. Because when men are redeemed, they are created again. They are renewed in the inward man and the outward man. And one day will be finally delivered from all the effects of sin as a result of redemption. And therefore there will be a restoring of the image that was lost in the fall. The image of God. Man was made in the image of God. And so, as I say, the question is, who is in view here in Genesis 1, 26? Let us make man in our own image? The answer, of course, is given by other scriptures that attribute creation to the Son of God 
and to the Spirit of God. You think, for example, of Psalm 33, verse 6, just to mention a powerful statement of the entire Godhead cooperating in creation. What does it say? By the word of the Lord or Jehovah were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath or the spirit of his mouth. And there you have three persons. Jehovah, the Word, the Spirit, all working together in creation. And so you have the whole Godhead seen in that verse with regard to a creation. And so we can bring that back into Genesis 1, 26, because the making of man is part of creation. Let us make man, it says. Let us create man. And surely, in the light of Psalm 33, 6, we can say that those in view on this marvelous statement, let us make man, are the three persons of the Godhead. And so you can go to other, you can go to other scripture where you read specifically, specifically that the Spirit created like Psalm 104 and the verse number 30, where it says this, Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. And then you go to other scriptures where it says specifically that Jesus Christ created. Uh, for example, John 1 there, we have that great statement about our Lord Jesus Christ, verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so in a very simple way, because this is simple deduction from the word of God. Who is in view in that language of consultation? What does it present to us? We can draw from these other scriptures and say that there, well, obviously there's a plurality of persons there. Let us make man. And then we bring it down to the three, because the Father created, and the Son created, and the Spirit created. And with those specific scriptures, that make that absolutely clear. And so that verse reveals that God consulted with himself the significance of the word us, the pronoun us, is simply to emphasize the plurality of persons in the Godhead. And so there is one proposition that we see as we study the Word of God uh, that the Trinity is revealed in statements like that that cannot be understood in any other way except teaching the Trinity. But then the Bible makes certain other uh, propositions of a very specific kind. It does say that God is one, doesn't it? Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 the Lord our God is one Lord. It's referring to one supreme, eternal, unchangeable, infinite being. And you see, brethren and sisters, there can only be one such God. You can't have a plurality of separate gods who are all eternal, unchangeable, and infinite. That's impossible. But that verse is a classic verse that sets forth that God is one. But then there are verses that clearly state also that the Father is God. You take 1 Corinthians 8, verse number 6. There is one God, the Father. And there are verses that say that Jesus Christ is God. In John 1, verse 1. Take that verse again. In the beginning was the Word. And remember that the, the name Word is that wonderful presentation of Christ as the one who is the revelation of God. That's the sense of that name. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. But it says there the Word was with God. Literally, in your end, the Word was face to face with God. In other words, there are two persons in that particular part of that verse. But the point is, the Bible says the Father is God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is God. Acts 5, a classic passage even 
in a sense, for that particular point. The story of Ananias and Sapphira. And we read there of how Peter charged them with having lied to God. But in the same context, he says you lied to the Holy Ghost. And so, in that way, the Bible shows the deity of the Holy Spirit. And so the Father is called God, is described as God. So is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. And so there are, there's another proposition. So the first one is God is one. Then secondly, that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. And as I've said also, we can say this, the Bible attributes divine qualities or divine attributes to each person. Of course, I don't have time to start going through all the attributes of deity. But you can think, for example, of omniscience. Matthew 6, verse 32. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. And that's a reference to the Father's knowledge of every one of his children. Countless multitudes on the face of the earth at any one given time. And the Lord's teaching there as he taught the disciples, uh, whatever the day might be, whatever the number might be, with regard to all those who are truly the Lord's, your heavenly Father knoweth. That requires omniscience. The Father is omniscient. John, or John 2. Look at that statement of the omniscience of Jesus Christ. John 2.24, among other verses that could be presented. John 2.24, Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. And of course the demonstration of that fact of the omniscience of Christ is then immediately in view when you come into chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and the Lord knew everything about him. He knew who he was. He knew what was wrong with him. He knew what he needed because Christ is omniscient. You see the same with Peter in John chapter 1 where the Lord saved Peter. What did he say? He said, Thou art Peter, the son of Jonas. And there he was telling Peter, essentially, I know everything about you. I know your name. He never met Peter before, I mean, in the flesh. The Lord, Peter had never seen the Lord until this moment. And you can imagine how Peter felt. Jesus Christ is telling him, I know your name, I know your father's name, and I know what you need. He said, Thou art Peter, the son of Jonas. Thou shalt be Cephas. Which by interpretation is stolen. So, what's going on there? In his omniscience, the Lord Jesus saw Peter, he saw Nicodemus. He's telling them, I'm omniscient, I am God. I know you through and through. It's a very searching matter, isn't it? As we apply it to our own hearts, the Lord knows every one of us. Or 1 Corinthians 2, the omniscience of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. And look at those verses with me here, please, as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 10. In fact, verse number 9, before I move into verse 10. Verse 9 says, As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now the expression there, the things that God has prepared for them that love him, is descriptive of the whole gospel. But it tells us in verse 9 that the natural man, the unregenerate man, does not know those truths. He cannot understand them. I has not seen, he has not heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man. The man there is the natural man, the fallen man. He does not understand the gospel. So that's important just to get the setting for verse 10. What does verse 10 say? But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. 
for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And the verb searcheth there does not mean that the Holy Spirit is limited in his knowledge and has to search to find answers. The verb search there indicates the idea of present knowledge before the mind of the Spirit. It means that at any given moment the Holy Spirit knows everything. He's omniscient. And therefore out of that omniscience he reveals to men in the great work of regeneration or the miracle of regeneration. He deals with our hearts and he reveals to them the gospel. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. Because the Holy Spirit knows the deep things of God because he is God. And so all these scriptures add up to this fact that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. We can see this in very clear terms. But another matter here bringing us toward the end of what I want to say today and is this. The Father, the Bible makes it clear the Father is not the Son, and neither of them, and the Son is not the Father, and neither the Father nor the Son is the Holy Ghost. Now that's why I read from Isaiah 48. I want you to go look at that chapter, Isaiah 48. And verse number 16, and there we read, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was there and I, and now the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. This, of course, is messianic. This is a prophecy, a predictive prophecy, a predictive promise, actually, concerning Christ and his Messiahship. And it's written here, of course, by Isaiah. It's not about Isaiah. It's Christ. And look carefully at those words, because the speaker here, is one who's been sent by the Lord God and the Spirit. And that, of course, is the Messiah. The speaker is a divine person. Look at verse 12, part B, because the same person speaking the whole way down the chapter. And in verse 12, he says this toward the end of the verse. I am the first. I also am the last. You have those words, as you will know, in Revelation. Revelation 1, Revelation uh, one eleven, so on. You find the same words uh, where the Lord refers to himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is Jesus Christ. So he is the one who's speaking, is sent by the Father and the Spirit. He is a divine person because of those names, that wonderful name rather, I am the first and the last. Furthermore, he has been there from the beginning. With regard to the beginning of all things, he says, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I. And so, who is this? This person sent by the other two persons, this is obviously our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. What are we finding? We're finding one divine person being sent by the other two divine persons, and that they are distinct the one from the other. So what a marvelous way we find it to be that the Lord reveals to us the doctrine of the Trinity. And I've only been scratching the surface here. As I've said already, the doctrine of the Trinity is, yes, it is the most mysterious doctrine in the Christian faith. One God, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, taking his divine essence, and yet three persons in the Godhead. And we approach this doctrine, brethren, today, sisters, with reverence and with godly fear. You see, the problem with regard to men who deny it, who have gone off in the Trinity, it's simply because they will say, well, I can't understand this, therefore it can't be true. That's what they actually are saying. Therefore, they're putting their own minds above the Scriptures. 
divine revelation. Since there is one God, and since the Father is God, and since the Son is God, and since the Holy Spirit is God, and since they are clearly distinguished in the Scriptures, what is revealed to us in that kind of data or information? Holy inspired words is the glorious truth of the Trinity. One God eternally existing as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each possessing the whole essence of deity. And this glorious trinity of persons operating in perfect harmony and in unison in all the works of the Godhead in creation, in providence, and in redemption. I take you in closing to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and look, please, at the verse number 2. 1 Peter 1, verse number 2. It says, I like to according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Just take those words, please, and think about them with me here as I bring this session to a close because in those words we are in the realm of redemption. It's clearly brought before us in that language. And notice that there are three persons in view here. There is God the Father clearly set before us. It says the foreknowledge of God the Father. The word foreknowledge means foreordination. How how do we understand the use of the word Father with regard to the Trinity? He stands as the representative of the whole Godhead in terms of the eternal purpose of the whole Godhead. That's why he's called the Father. That's why we refer to him as the first person. There's a person in the Godhead called the Father. And that's the reason why he's called the Father. He stands as that representative person of the whole Godhead. And therefore we call the second person who's mentioned in the last place in this verse, but Lord Jesus, we call him the Son because we read in the Scriptures, and you take us back to the Gospel of John, which is hated by the modernists and by the liberals and the cults because of its presentation of deity and trinity and so forth. But you take the Gospel of John and you find that the Son speaks there of his relationship with the Father from all eternity. And then it also, uh, I say this in passing, in the Gospel of John, you've got those other verses, not only the one like the Father and I are one, but the other verses where Christ seems to be inferior to the Father. And that's where it's so misunderstood because when Christ says that the Father is greater than I, what does he mean? He's speaking there in his role as the mediator who came into the world to do the will of the Godhead. And in that sense, he subordinated himself to the will of the Father. That's what it means. Not that in essence he's inferior to the Father regarding deity, but with regard to his function as the mediator of the new covenant. And so there is the Father mentioned in 1 Peter 1 2. There is the Son mentioned there with regard to his precious blood. And right away you're at the cross. Right away you're in the realm of redemption. Right away you're seeing what the Lord Jesus came to do. He came to save sinners. And how wonderful that God became man and yet did not cease to be God. There are certain groups in Northern Ireland, say this in passing, but it really annoys me you know what they say? We hate that phrase, that expression, the God man. And these are people who claim to be evangelical. The God man. Why 
Is Christ described or referred to as the God man? Because he is the God man. Two distinct natures in one person. That, of course, is a mystery in the sense of the impossibility of you and I plumbing the depths of the complex person of Jesus Christ. But remember this. It was the God-man who was on the tree. It was the God-man who took your place, who died for your sin. And then the application of that redemptive work of Christ is by the Holy Spirit. Well, that's what's in view there in 1 Peter 1 2, in those words, through sanctification of the Spirit. The word sanctification is used there in a broad sense. It's used in a narrow sense very often with regard to the actual purging and cleansing of the Christian. But here, it's a reference to the entire work of the Spirit in the application of redemption. Sanctification, it does mean purging, but it basically it means to set apart. And so the Holy Spirit sets men apart in the new birth to begin with. And he sets them apart as he works on in their hearts by indwelling their hearts. And he sets them apart as he sanctifies them and, and takes them on through that whole process. And he sets them apart when they come to die and the soul is perfected in holiness, as the Word of God says. The spirits of just men made perfect. And he sanctifies them finally when he will raise, as the agent of the Godhead, their bodies out of death to be reunited with their souls and to live and reign with Christ forevermore. But this verse, 1 Peter 1, 2, is a Trinitarian verse undoubtedly in the whole context of that great goal of the triune Godhead to save a people from their sins. Brother and sister, let me say to you today, any man or group of men who, who deny the Trinity, who, who work against it or whatever they do, it's because of their enmity to redemption in the final analysis. They do not want to be told that they can't save themselves. Therefore, in their pride, as they think that they can save themselves, they attack all three persons of the Godhead. And that means that you and I, in our defense of the Godhead, among other ways in which we defend it, is to bring it all within the scope and the context of redemption, as we must do with the whole Bible, See that this triune God purpose from all eternity to save us from our sins. And if there were no Trinity, put it that way, there would be no redemption. We rejoice in that great truth. Let us love it, let us preach it, let us stand for it. In our day and time, may God bless his word to your hearts for his own name's sake.